Because of the scope of this class, I'm not going to be able to really delve into um, the letters, um, also called the epistles. Um, this is kind of upsetting for me because um, there are the majority of Christians have read these and the Gospels the most. The New Testament is really um, all that a lot of New Testament uh, Christians have ever have ever read, and and. So I would like to spend a lot of time on this, but because of the span of this course, it's only meant to be a very basic idea, um, I'm going to have to go through them very quickly. And so if there's any questions about things broadly, please ask them. But remember, this is not going to be a Bible study on those books. I, I am sorry for that, but that's just not the purpose of this course. Okay, so let's first start with a, with a time frame here. Um, remember, I talked about the Herods and whatnot in the last lesson. I talked about the way that Jesus was born around 6 BC, okay? So he dies about 30. Um, and pretty much right after his death, three days later, he, he's, he, he, he's, he um, is raised from the dead. And then uh, a couple within a couple months, he, he ascends into heaven. And 40 days after that, um, the church has started in Jerusalem with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it is during this time, shortly after this, you know, thousands are being saved. And then um, Stephen, who is, or Stephen, is one of the, um, whatever you want to call them, elders, if you want to, whatever, it doesn't matter, um, that is appointed. He, he's one of them, and he is killed. There's a man there who sees this, um, the first official Christian martyr, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, and Paul sees this and, and agrees with what's being done. And then shortly after this, excuse me, um, he is saved around 32, somewhere in there. Okay? So the uh, a, the letter of James, uh, near the end of your Bible, and uh, end of your New Testament, is written about 45, making it the oldest, uh, potentially, um, Christian writing. This one or Mark. Uh, depending on um, on just depending on which one was actually written first, but both of them are were written in the in the mid 40s somewhere. Um, so uh, Paul is saved in around 32. He converts in around 32, but he doesn't go to his first, on his first missionary trip until around 47. Now this is recorded in Acts, so I'm not really going to spend too much time explaining where he goes on that. Plus, we're going to look at that uh, here in a little bit. Um, so then uh, he writes Galatians um, shortly after being at that place. He, he starts a church in Leeds, and then almost very with, within the span of, of, not, of months, really, um, the the church kind of starts uh, starts adopting these these um, heresies uh, that really it looks like maybe the Jews were, were were starting about needing to still follow the law and convert to you know circumcision and all those kinds of different things and and Paul is just wow that was that was quick that this that you've believed this when I when we already talked about this before um, so he writes that in 48 before really um, right it's the first thing he writes but it's really at the start of his of his public ministry of evangelism ministry I mean um, and so then in Acts 15 I mentioned something called the Apostolic Council this was very important because they were figuring out that salvation it was for everyone and that for the Holy Spirit was for everyone and that there the only requirement was 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 salvation through Jesus Christ and so this is kind of a major point um, in fact, Peter and Paul had gotten in, in a tiff um, about this before the Apostolic Council, some somewhere around 48 or so, and um, he men and Paul mentions the, this this argument that they had in, in Galatians, and so somewhere between there and Acts 15, um, they evidently resolve the issue because Peter totally agrees that um, they shouldn't be burden burdening the apostles, and, and so does James, and so it just kind of works out. Immediately after that, Paul leaves on a, on his second missionary journey. Um, but this time, he doesn't take someone named Mark. See, on his first missionary trip, Paul had taken Barnabas and, uh, and Barnabas' relative uh, Mark, which is the same Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark and was um, with Peter towards the end of his life. 
Um, and also, oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but this time, he goes to set on his second missionary trip, and Barnabas says, hey, we should take Mark, and Paul says, hey, we shouldn't, because he left us on the last trip. So they get in a tiff, and eventually Barnabas and Mark leave um, on, on their trip, and Mark or Paul takes a man by the name of um, Silas on his missionary trip. Um, which obviously is a pretty significant thing because two of the kind of uh, important people to evangelism are now in an argument <laughs> about uh, who they shouldn't should and shouldn't give grace to. Um, long story short, uh, eventually Paul and Mark are reconciled as um, Paul specifically says that that Mark is of use to him and, and that he you know desires to see him before his death. Uh, much later on though, um, that's in like. Uh, uh, just shy of 20 years. Um, so we don't know how long this tiff went on for. Uh, the Jews um, were kicked out of Rome in 49, which is a big deal because that's going to affect the epistle known as Romans. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so then while on his second missionary trip, uh, Paul writes to the Thessalonica, um, which is the uh, letters of first and second Thessalonians that you have in your Bible. Between 50 and 52, they were written really back to back, somewhere in the same area there. Uh, and then Paul has his third missionary trip around 52, somewhere. Um, and it's in 54 that the Jews are finally re allowed to return to Rome. Now, where did the Christian church start in Rome? Well, um, some people say Peter started it in Rome, uh, Catholicism, uh, for instance. Well, whereas other people say that it was after, um, in the beginning of Acts, when a lot of people were being saved... Uh, it, it was those people who then went back to Rome, where they came from, and the church just kind of naturally started there. Then Peter ro went over there and, and helped it to grow, and then Paul eventually uh, ended up there too. Um, either way, it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, what is important is that the Romans uh, mentioned the way that the reason why the Jews were kicked out, were kicked out was because um, of some issues with, with, with uh, strife. Um, on behalf of a name, man named uh, Crestus, I believe is, is what they say, which a lot of scholars believe um, they're talking about uh, basically Christ. So the difference between Christians and Jews, the, the, they were, there was a distinction being made between Jews and Christians, and uh, this was causing some tiffs, uh, which interesting point, um, most of the early church persecution was caused by the Jews, not the Romans. The Romans didn't really care until after 100 AD, somewhere around there. Um, or around 180, I shouldn't say after, because uh, John, for instance, but not important. Uh, moving forward, um, so the Jews are finally allowed to return back to Rome, and at this time you can imagine that, that the church is going to be pretty divided because there, while the Jews were gone, the only Christians that would have been there would have been Gentile. So then with the Jews suddenly returning in 54 uh, to, the, to, to the church in Rome, you can imagine how that might cause some problems between, well, I am Jew, and oh, well, it doesn't that matter? So, um, the Gospel of Mark was written, uh, we're going to say, uh, in the mid-50s somewhere, making it the earliest of the Gospels, but probably not written in the 40s, um, although some people would argue for that. Um, and then, uh, while Paul is on his third missionary trip, he writes First and Second Corinthians, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then after this, he heads back towards Jerusalem, where he is arrested, and it's in somewhere around there that he writes the letter of uh, um, the letter to the Romans, um, to the Roman churches, I should say. Uh, Jude and Hebrews were both written sometime in the 60s. Not, not really sure of when. Um, Luke and Acts were written. Uh, you can see there about 60, 64, somewhere in the early 60s. Uh, Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians were all written while Paul was imprisoned, probably in Rome. Um, no, I mean in Rome. Sorry, in Rome. Uh, all kind of sent together, too. Uh, Colossians and Ephesians have a lot in common, um, and Philemon is just written more of to a specific person, not really to a church. Um, so then that takes us to these things over here. Let me move this sucker. There we go. Um, and Philippians was written a little bit later, um, in his in while Paul is still uh, imprisoned, but then shortly after Philippians is written, um, Paul is released from Roman imprisonment and writes First and Saint, First Timothy and Titus, and Paul Peter also writes uh, First Peter right before Emperor Nero starts persecuting uh, Christians. What had happened was there was a, a fire in Rome, and Nero, long story short, is looking for a scapegoat, and so he starts killing uh, Christians. Long story short, I mean, it's 
way more complicated than that, but this really isn't a history class, and it's not really that important. Just that you understand that Emperor Nero started persecuting in about 64 or 65. Um, so then in about 65, the Gospel of Ma Matthew was written. I have it where Luke is written before uh, Matthew, but that's not necessarily for certain, okay? Um, so then St. Peter and St. Timothy are written, and Paul and Peter are both uh, imprisoned and killed. Um, sometime around 67, uh, as uh, Emperor Nero, the persecution under Emperor Nero stopped in 68, when Emperor Nero killed himself. So, uh, there's all that. Uh, and then there's a slight uh, quiet time between the 60s and the 80s where no, no preserved Christian doc documents exist. And we get to the Gospel of John, which was written in about 89, as I already mentioned in um, the last lesson. So then uh, John also writes three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and somewhere between the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there. Um, and then Re the book of Revelation was written in 96, about. So that just gives a real quick drive-by of the history there. You can see a lot of stuff was going on. If I wasn't clear on that, please ask a question. If I went too fast, have no fear. It is a video you can simply stop and rewind and watch again. So that takes us to the letters, the last real segment of the um, of the Bible, and I'm not going to separate Revelations from the rest of the letters because I don't really want to make uh, it a big thing. Um, once again, this is supposed to be a real simple breakdown of um, of the Bible, and I am afraid that if I go any further, it's just going to make it too confusing. So Revelations will be included with the letters. Um, the letters were written relatively a short span of time, the 40s to the 90s. That's not that big of a deal. Seems how the Old Testament was written between the 1400s and the 400s, like a thousand year of span, and then the New Testament letters are just within this period of, you know, 40 years. You know, it's kind of a, a big, big change. Um, as far as who wrote the letters, Paul wrote Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Really, he wrote a large chunk of, of those letters. But then there's uh, one letter that's called Anonymous. We don't know who wrote it. That's Hebrews. Um, yeah. And then there's the letters which are self-titled. Don't, they, they're not titled for the people who they were sent to. They're titled from the people who wrote them. James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, who were written by James, Peter, and John. Um, so then uh, that, that leaves the book of Revelation, the last book in your Bible, written by John. Um, so when reading these uh, through, remember two things. First, they were written to address specific situations, to remove the Bible from the context it was written in is to miss the point of what's being said totally. Some people try to turn the New Testament into a new Old Testament where it's just another list of laws. So maybe, you know, the do's and the don'ts and you have to live just perfect, but that's completely against what the whole Bible is talking about. Some people try to just remove something from its context um, and then apply it to their life without any understanding of what it originally meant. Obviously, you can see how that's gonna how that would cause problems. So then the second thing to remember is that it was intended for Christians and it was carefully written. What that means is that it was not written to be to beat non-Christians over the head, which is sad because that's how a large portion of it is used today. The Book of Revelation, for instance, is used more to scare people than to give them hope, which is completely different than what it was originally written for. And also, they were carefully written, the words carefully chosen. Um, you can tell that by looking at them. Um, really, the only exception is one of Paul, uh, Peter's letters, which we don't really have time to get into that. But long story short, very, very meticulous, uh, meticulously written. So the first of these to look at is the letter of James. And once again, I'm sorry, but we're not going to be able to really look at these real in depth. Um so the letter of James is the first. It was written by James, who was actually related to Jesus around 45. However, it's interesting to note that James probably wasn't even saved until after Jesus resurrected. Uh, Paul mentions specifically about how Jesus, after the resurrection, went to James specifically. And why, but uh, why then would he do that unless it was uh, to prove his deity to him and James was then saved? Um, in which case, that would probably make James the first of Jesus' family to be saved. 
besides potentially marry the mother. Um, however, this is speculation. Nothing is clearly said in, in scripture. The rest is just tradition. Um, it was written to the Christian Jews in the, in the Syrian area, um, which is the area immediately above uh, Israel. Um, yeah. Uh, and if you, uh, James has, has a large, uh, well, has a large emphasis, uh, um, a large, um, mm, he was influenced largely uh, by Jewish thought. Um, you're going to see that a little more in James than, than in some of the other, new, uh, some of the rest of the New Testament. As far as what's going on in the book of James, um, there were these Christians who were not being treated fairly. They were not being paid, and the the wealthy land landlords, um, the landowners, could have uh, paid them on time, but they were withholding wages. They were just not being, generally speaking, uh, nice people. The Christians were were getting very weighed down by this, um, and given the fact that um, the Jews were at odds with them already over uh, over uh, the whole Jesus thing. Uh, <laughs> Was causing a, a big, a big conflict for them. Uh, they were starting to become very weighted down. And I know some people would say, "How weighted down could you get in 15 years?" And you'd be surprised. Christians, even nowadays, um, when going through different things within the span of a couple years, get weighted down. So this isn't that big of a statement to say 15 years they were getting bogged down. Um, they were, they were getting very discouraged. And so James writes them this letter to encourage them. It uses a very unique proverb style. It has a lot of wisdom literature emphasis. Um, it does, however, rely on Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, which Matthew 5-7 through 7, uh, records. Um, it's unclear as to whether James uses Matthew 5-7 through 7, or if he was simply there for when Jesus did it, or if he heard about it, or whatever. Um, and also uh, uh, relates strongly to Leviticus chapter 19. Um you can read that through for yourself. So James as a whole is to encourage weary Christians. Which takes us, takes us to the book of Galatians, the first of Paul's letters. And you can see here he leaves from this area, goes down to Cyprus, down around. And this area right here is called Galatia. Obviously, this is um, Galatia. You can see goes like this. So Galatia is this big area here. However, it was written to southern Galatia because that was the place that Paul actually was. Um, this was somewhere, I, I know the map says 44 to 46. I date uh, his first missionary journey a little bit later at around 47. But it really doesn't matter um, in the ground scheme of things. Just that you understand that it was his first missionary journey and that Galatians was written after or during that, but before the Apostolic Council as recorded in Acts 15, which happened in 49. Um so the situation growing, there's a lot of growing tension between Jews and Gentiles. The, the Gentiles are, are new to the faith. They're very unsure as to um, how the Jewish thought relates to their Christianity, as a lot of Christians are today. And so the Jews were making them think that they had to uh, partake of the law in order to be saved. And Paul is telling them, no, you do not. As I already told you once, this is the actual true gospel. If anybody else tells you anything else, they are to be accursed. So... Uh, that's kind of the situation there, just the tension between the Jewish way of doing things and salvation. Um, obviously, I mentioned this. It's before the Apostolic Council mentioned in Acts chapter 15, as the issue has not been resolved yet, which after Acts 15, they did resolve the issue, and there was official statement from the church as to um, what the belief was with uh, how Jews and Gentiles were related. Um so it really addresses the true gospel and the law, not about works, but about salvation by grace. Um, and then Paul goes on his second missionary journey right after the Apostolic Council of Acts 15, which is somewhere around, around 49, AD 49, somewhere around there, okay? And from this, he goes up to Antioch, over to Tarsus, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. This is the places of, of Galatia that, that he's already been, but then he decides to go somewhere new. However, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't let him go, go to Bithynia, so instead he goes over here to Troas after receiving a dream, and over here to Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Apol Apollonia, Berea, Thessalonica, which a lot of these you're going to uh, notice, um, Athens, Corinth, the Church of Corinth, this is where, where they were started, Paul founded it, and uh, later, in, in a few years, he's going to have to write them to, to uh, work out some issues that, that there was there. Uh, Thessalonica, this was the church, excuse me, right here. Um, where the Thessalonians were, 
um, Philippi, Philippians, um, you can see that Paul started um, really a lot of these different uh, uh, churches that he's going to write letters to. Uh, so this was he wrote First and Second Thessalonians right back to back around 50 or 51. Um, as far as what was going on, there was just some general misunderstandings from from, from new converts uh, in regards to uh, lifestyle and when Jesus was, was returning or if he already had. Which is why Craig Blomberg says that the themes of First and Second Thessalonian is Jesus is coming soon, and Second Thessalonian, Thessalonians theme is but not that soon. Um, and if you read them together, you can kind of get a balanced view of lifestyle and also um, Jesus' return. Um, yeah, one of the big things was they were kind of confused. Has he come yet? Or, I mean, is he going to come? Or what's going on there? So, um, I don't really have time to really get into that, but that's what's going on there. Which takes us to the Church of Corinth. Now, um, the, it, they were started on, uh, the Church at Corinth was started on Paul's uh, second missionary journey, but when he gets back, you can see here he goes back to Jerusalem. Okay, and um, or actually to Antioch. I'm sorry, he goes back to Antioch, and uh, when he when he leaves again, he goes back this way again. But this time, after here, he goes down here to Ephesus, and he stays there for about three years. Then he goes goes up here, re reviews some of this, and makes a special trip down to Corinth before going back this way um, and then back to um, back this way along here to Jerusalem to face his imprisonment. Um, so just a few things here. Paul starts the church of, of Corinth on his second missionary journey. This is about 51 or so. Okay, um, And Paul writes them, which is a letter that we've actually lost. There, we don't have uh, whatever letter this was. It's, it's just lost. We don't have it. And then uh, the Church of Corinth writes, him, writes Paul, plus he receives some reports as to what's going on in the Church um, of Corinth. So then Paul replies, which is 1 Corinthians, which is somewhere around 55. Now, obviously, this is in the middle of Paul's third missionary journey, and he's around Ephesus somewhere. Um, so then Paul visits while in Ephesus, he because he's in Ephesus for three years. Excuse me, right there. So then he, he sells across and makes a special trip to Corinth and goes back to Ephesus. Um <clears throat> so he makes makes a special trip. Then he writes them again. This is another lost letter, and then he writes Second Corinthians in fifty six uh, to res to resolve the last of the things. And then lastly, he makes or finally he makes a special trip um, right here, as I showed you already on this map, all the way over here to Corinth. Uh, hits these churches first, but then makes his way down here to Corinth and makes a special trip in about fifty seven, uh, and then comes back this way. Uh, and Acts says that he purposed in his heart to go back to Jerusalem, even though he knew he was going to get arrested, and um, then sent off to Rome. And that's kind of what his idea was the whole time. So as far as First and Second Corinthians, it was written by Paul uh, during 55-56. Um, as far as what the situation was, there's this worldly atmosphere that's going on, and it's affecting the church's life, worship, and growth. There's kind of two extremes. Um, there's... Uh, there's those people who are self-indulging, doing whatever they want. You know, I know that it's okay for me to eat these, eat the meat sacrificed to the idols because there actually are no other gods besides God. Then there's those other people who are who have a weaker conscience, is what Paul says, and they're stuck on self-denial, like monks or something, where they're all like, okay, well, we have to abstain from that meat because it's uh, it's unholy. See what I mean? So um, there's this kind of this this um, rift in the church. Um, and, and, and they're not really sure how, how, how to work through it, and there's some people who are being just arrogant, and, and the people who are self de in self-denial think that they're so much better, and the people in self-indulgence think that they're so much better. So you really just have an issue of arrogance in First Corinthians, I mean in Corinthians, really in general. Um, Corinth was a wealthy city, um, and it was full of pagan festivals, full of, of pagan ideas, um, and it was just uh, very easy for that to get into the church. And so as a result... There were some cliques that were started in the church, like, for instance, between the rich and the poor. The rich would flaunt their wealth, whereas the poor were kind of ostracized. Um, and then, once again, I already mentioned those who, who believed in indulging the flesh and those who believed in denying the flesh. Um, so, really, in, in all things considered, Corinth can be summated with this. Treat others with love and don't, do what just, and don't just do what sounds good. In other words, put some thought into this. Think about God. Think about uh, others around you. Don't just do things for, for what you think is right and wrong. Um, and so then 2 Corinthians was written uh, 
afterwards, but it was written over a series of times as Paul is traveling. Um, chapters four, 1 through 7, it, it, Paul's talking about his ministry, but he's using very tender tones. Um, in chapters 8 through 9, Paul talks about the offering for Jerusalem, but then come chapters 10 through 13, Paul revisits his ministry, but he uses very tough tones. Um, yeah. Uh, and so then after all this, Paul has set in his heart um, as all. Well, I'm not going to go back. But Paul has set, his, has set in his heart to go back to Jerusalem and get arrested and then be sent to Rome. Um, so he goes back as that last map showed um, and ends up here in, in, in Jerusalem. And he's, he's there for two years before being shipped off to Rome, yeah, which he, he gets they get lost at sea for two weeks. But then they get, uh, he gets sent off to Rome up here where he spends another two years in, in, in prison. Um, so written, Paul, uh, the letter to Romans was written before Paul went to Romans, either while he was imprisoned in Jerusalem or right before this. Um, as far as what the situation is, he's trying to address the rift that is between the Jews and the Gentiles um, um, at that church. Um, and that's one of his main themes throughout the whole thing, really, is that all are sinners and in need of Jesus. Um, the Jews aren't any better, and the, and the Gentiles aren't, aren't any worse. Everyone needs Jesus for salvation. Um, but you see, with Romans, kind of a change in his ministry. He's not wanting to go to the same areas again. And he's also writing a church that he has never been to. He's never been to Rome, and yet he's writing uh, the letter of, uh, of Romans. And you're also going to see that with, with the letter to Colossians. See, Paul had never been to Col uh, Colossae either. I, um, Colossae either. Um, so he's just preparing for this change and unsure of kind of what's going to happen. So it's somewhere in here that the book of Jude is written, somewhere in the 60s. Um, it was written by Jude's, uh, I'm sorry, by uh, Jesus' brother Jude. Um, so James and Jude were both uh, Jesus' brother. Jesus also had another brother named uh, Joseph. Um, and uh, at least one sister, and then Joseph and Mary, his father and mother. Well, father and mother. Um... It was written to Christians outside of Israel, but as far as where, it's been up in the air in debate, so it's not really important anyways. Um, Jude is actually used in the, in the letter of 2 Peter, um, chapter 2, it is very close to Jude. Uh, P Peter used it um, when he was writing his epistle. Um, as far as what the situation uh, is, there are some false teacher teachers condoning living lawlessly. See... A lot of times people get stuck on the whole legalism thing. You know, you have to do these things to get saved. But there are also people going to the other extreme saying, you can live however you want. See what I mean? But the sign of salvation is a changed life. True faith in God necessitates a change in lifestyle. So the, the main theme there in Jude is contend for the faith. Um, and we're going to pick up with Hebrews. Uh, well... I'll finish up with Hebrews. Hebrews is, is a very misunderstood book, just like uh, the letter of James and uh, Revelations are. Um, it was written by an anonymous person in the 60s somewhere. Um, be careful when reading Hebrews about creating a doctrine off of a passage that you don't understand very well. Um, I will say this, that Hebrews contains warnings to people so that they wouldn't throw away their Christian life for the sake of uh, comfort. And I will say that um, it has nothing to do with blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Um, in fact, I'll go ahead and mention that. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when, for instance, in the Gospel of, uh, Gospel of Matthew, where it's, where it's mentioned, um, the, the Pharisees are attributing something that the Holy Spirit had done to Satan. And then Jesus goes on to say, uh, if a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. Basically, you can't accidentally commit this sin. It is something that comes from your innermost being. Okay. Now, in Hebrews, he warns about um, leaving the faith. And it's important, just as George Guthrie once, once noted, that he's talking about people who are willingly, at this moment, abandoning Christ. He's not talking about the way that if you backslide, you can never be saved again. He's not mentioning that. And he's not saying that you can never be backslide, never backslide obviously, as that would uh, defeat the whole purpose of writing the letter. Um, so he's writing to Christians who are in a place where they're allowing things into their lives, which could eventually cause a hard heart, which, could cause, which will cause them to abandon Christ. 
Um, and that's really what he's talking about. So it's written to Christians with with a Jewish background, a very strong Jewish background. Obviously, they, they've had some experience with the sect, or they just know what the sect believes or something. Um, but they're probably in Rome, uh, unsure about that, uh, but they, they were very strongly impacted by, by Judaism. Um, so, as far as what the situation are, is, some are wanting to go back to the Jewish practices for both safety and habit and comfort. Or, for safety, habit, and comfort. Okay? It, they, they, they wouldn't have been persecuted by Jews or Rome. Uh, it was something familiar to them, and it was comfortable. It was easier than going into the unknown. Um, Hebrews is really a long sermon and strongly depends on the books of the law. Those are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Strongly depends on those books. Um, and really, it, it, it Hebrews summarizes this. Keep your focus on Christ. Don't get bog, bogged down by sin. Keep your focus on Christ. Now, once again, I'm sorry that I have to keep, go through these so quickly, but I'm going to have to stop there now. Um, and we'll pick up with this at, at Philemon um, in the next video, but that's where we're going to stop for this one. Uh, thank you.